Hi, this is Gurusi Singh and you're listening to my Thick Accent podcast. Before we get into today's episode, I want to discuss a few housekeeping items. First, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, please consider doing it. Podcast production is not easy, it requires a lot of time and effort, and we can continue only and only with your support. And second, if you would like to share your immigrant story or know somebody I should invite next to the podcast, please reach out to us at hello at mythickaccent.com or you can also DM us on Instagram the handle is mythickaccent. Now let's get to the episode. <music> So growing up I used to participate in every extracurricular activities from allocution to art and craft to dramatics to even planning and many more and I wanted to build a career in one of those but guess what stream I chose after my 10th grade science or how we call it in India medical and non medical that focuses on the subjects of physics chemistry and mathematics not that I could not pursue any of those desired careers after my 12th grade but i chose science only because my aunts and uncles and distant acquaintances wanted me to do so then immediately after my 12th grade i decided to get myself admitted into bachelor's in journalism and mass communication and i absolutely loved it and that's what introduced me to advertising the career i am in right now so why should anybody be given the opportunity or the power to choose a career for you and my guest today is a passionate believer of this that one should not follow a path to fulfill the expectations of friends family or society it should be a choice that they make for themselves so she moved from india to canada in 2011 and in the past one decade she has been a professor at seneca college co-founded education training research employment consulting firm she is a host at linkedin local an initiative recognizing the need for human interactions she is a regional ambassador for greater toronto area for career professionals of canada she is also a recruitment consultant and co-author of the book 21 resilient women Let's hear more from her about her journey from refusing to listen the unwanted voice to embracing her slogan career by choice. Please welcome Tarannum Khan. Thank you so much Gurusees for that sumptuous introduction. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I actually had to cut it short and you know because the list of your accolades is endless and I love that. Oh well, you know, you can just keep trying and the one thing that I strongly believe in is learning and kind of that is the trajectory um that you will notice mm-hmm. it's interesting that you mentioned um having to take sciences while mm-hmm. wanting to be a part of the arts uh, uh courses and interests that actually happened to me but i kind of even pushed it back even at that time when i was in grade 10 mm-hmm. so got great uh results and guess what i went and i was very excited and I'm like oh i'm going to for my grade 11 choose arts programs i always wanted to study mm-hmm. um, music okay and um, yeah education music political science were my my areas of interest and the minute i came home after having selected my my courses my cousin was there and i was like mm-hmm. what you have such great marks why would you go and choose these subjects who asked you to do that and you know i was like for a second i was like oh my god did i mess up did i just ruin my career and future mm. and i'm like okay no this doesn't seem right and the next day i got up and i got dressed and i went back to the the higher secondary school that i was supposed to study and i'm like huh i want to i want to pursue uh, medical Mm-hmm. and then right the minute i said it i realized oh my god what am i going what am i doing this is not mm-hmm. my calling yes i enjoy uh, like you know biology as much as i enjoy uh, any of the art subjects but then i i haven't dreamt of being a doctor so why and that's mm-hmm. the only career path it's going to take me to and i'm going to be spending hours in labs and what not and i said no nope. i went back home without changing the subjects and carried forward with whatever i had 
I had chosen. I ended up studying classical instrumental for oh, wow. yeah for my um, grade eleven and twelve, along with mm. um, English literature and political science and education, and I loved it. I would not change it for anything. Awesome! I love that. I wish I could have the courage to do that because you know, uh, from the maternal side of my family, everybody is a doctor. Everybody, you know. Even right now, I have my younger siblings, you know, younger cousins who are pursuing, you know, some of the other fields related to the doctor. I was like, okay, <laughs> but I never wanted to get into that. I wanted to do something of my own. I didn't even try my father's business, but I was like, okay, I'll move abroad and I build something, my own empire, so to say. But um, yeah, you tell me, Trunum, how do you? you know, juggle between all these roles and also being a mother. Or tell me, how does a day in Tranum's life look like? Well, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Well, uh, you know, Gurusis, I take every every moment as it comes to me. Um, and I, I strongly believe that, uh, you know, each one of us, has many intersectionalities to our personalities, to our mm. career paths, to the lives we live. We are not the same person every minute of the day. So you are constantly anyone. It's not just I. Each one of us at a given point in time, I'm a daughter and I'm, mm -hmm. uh, you know, listening and doing what I'm being told. And there are moments when I'm a wife and I'm caring and nurturing towards mm -hmm. my husband. There are moments in a day when I'm uh, the mother who's either guiding and coaching or listening and learning at the same time, uh, because my sons are amazing and they share a lot of wisdom. Or I'm a, a co-worker where I am either providing support or feedback, or I'm an academician that's doing research and uh, coaching and advising students. So depending on the situation you are in, and I... This is mm -hmm. the aha moment. I, I have always lived my life like that, but I remember being in um, being at Rotman School of Management, attending the Business Edge program, and uh, one of the professors mentioned this: uh, situation determines uh, outcome, and mm. that's that's what uh, what it is. And I I I believe that that's how everybody. Uh, needs to approach situations because you cannot plan everything and not not everything that you plan is going to go according to what you want it to so mm. let let your life flow yeah i love that you know situation determines outcome that's that's so true but is there is there something uh, uh Tranum, that you have manifested or something if you look around you know something that you have manifested or something you wish you wanted to do that you do now absolutely and it's huge. It's interesting that you bring up manifestation, uh, Gursis, because I have been a part of visioning events, I would say, since 2017. I've been a presenter. Daisy Wright is a is a career coach uh, and executive leadership coach, mm -hmm. uh, great friend and a fellow CPC uh, ambassador, regional ambassador. She runs these visioning, visioning events every year, just once at the beginning of the year. So the one that's coming up is on January uh, 16th, if I'm not wrong. So you asked me, what is it that I'm doing that I had manifested? Mm -hmm. So yeah. the one thing that I stay away from is asking for money. Mm. I believe uh, I believe what whatever is due is going to come to you, whatnot, you work for it. And it, it, it takes its own course. But this time I created a vision board and I actually put dollar signs on it. And I can tell you, it has paid off big time. It has paid <laughs> off big time. I'm happy to say that uh, up, out of everything that was on my vision board, only one thing uh, that remains is publishing a book that I've been, I have worked on. It's compiled mm -hmm. and it's ready. Uh, but for some reason, uh, my co-author and I haven't been able to kind of get the kind of um, you know, time to be able to push the, give it the final push to have it published. So apart from that, everything that I put on that vision board that was manifested, I have been able to achieve. And I can tell you the, mm -hmm. the women that attended this, um, this visioning exercise, 
I will say at least 80 to 90 percent have been in touch and have been reporting the same thing that -hmm. they manifested it. They have put things on their vision board and it has come come to fruition. And was that the first time you got exposed to the the whole concept of manifestation or even before that you were like learning about it or you started anything? I I would say, all right. So I think um, India living, growing up in that culture, manifestation is a part of our daily lives, uh, a part of the religions that we live. Mm. So all all the religions that you can go back to, (laughs) whether it's Islam or, uh, you know, uh, Sikhism or for that matter, Hinduism, we talk about saying things positively, putting it out there in the universe, because you know how, how you say uh saraswati uh jeep pe vas karti hai and exactly, in yeah. islam you say uh, saate hasan hota hai which literally means that there are yeah. times in a day when you say those things they actually come true that's the exact literal translation even in punjabi we say no bota kahiye bota hoy you know say you have more and you'll get more exactly <laughs> exactly you ask for it and you shall uh, you know receive Exactly that. So manifestation has always been a part of the life. Ask for you. I have been very blessed, Kursis. I cannot complain. I can, There is no way I would be able to say I never had this or that or whatnot. God has been super kind. This universe has been very, very uh, benevolent when it comes to my life. But at the same time, I I'm, my parents always said, this is great. What you have is great, but always aspire for doing better than what you're doing right now. So that's that's the standard I live by. I always say I would want to be a better version of myself. Mm. And same thing for the things and entities in my life. So, you know, in the beginning, at some point, you were talking about money. Tarannum. Tell me, what, what, how old were you when the first time you started working? Interesting. Um... I remember the conversations I used to have with my mother when I was still in school, grade eight, nine, I believe. And at that point in time, I had enrolled myself into, a, uh, you know, those creative arts programs where I could go and learn painting. Mm. So I used to do these paintings, which were um, oil and glass and then decoupage. So I had created these paintings and I remember clearly going to a gift shop in in the vicinity of of the neighborhood that I lived. And I said, can you do me a favor? Can you keep these paintings here? And if they get sold, you can pay me a part of the, uh, you know, the portion of what you receive. Interesting. So that was my first business (laughs) venture. And that's how early I started thinking about um, earning for myself, being independent. Um, I guess uh, that 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 is the earliest time that I can remember. But then after that, I have tutored. I have uh, you know uh, been a TA at my mm-hmm. university. Um, I have had various businesses. I'm also a trained makeup artist, so mm. uh, I used to uh, be involved in that. So, so on and so forth. So as life came along, I'm somebody who experiments. Mm-hmm. I, I love adventure and exploring and constantly learning, learning new things, learning, being out of my comfort zone and exploring as much as I can. Tell, tell me, how does your relationship with money has changed so far? Like it's been years, right? The first time selling those paintings, so to say selling. How does relationship has changed with money? It hasn't changed. Hmm. I, so... The two things I have a lot of difficulty with. One is asking for money. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm not a great businesswoman. (laughs) I don't consider myself a good businesswoman because what what will end up happening is um, I will never ask. That's that's, uh, one uh, thing that I do. And I could not ask at that time. And I remember even at that time, those paintings actually got sold. Mm -hmm. And whatever the, the shopkeeper gave me, gave me. I never asked for more. Mm. I never negotiated at that point in time. Even now, I feel uh, it's not like, and again, it's not like I do not know my value because 
some coaches would say, oh, do you even understand your value? Because if if you're not confident in your value, you do not approach situations with uh, negotiating based on the skill sets you have Mm -hmm. or the value that you are bringing to the business. It's just that... I think that rests in the rests in the fact that I have had abundance. Mm. I've never needed. Mm. So I'm very comfortable with what I have. So whatever comes, comes, and I let it come to me naturally. I I believe that if you have value, opportunities come to you. And so same is true for money. So if you if people see value in the work you do, they will automatically approach you with um uh, a decent uh, whatever you know paycheck in return mm. that's how i look at it does it happen all the time not really because it it, it again it it depends on where they are at in their journey so for an example if you're going out and presenting at a uh, at a nonprofit you cannot expect them to be able to provide you um to an honorarium that will be in line with the actual, uh, you know, amount that a corporate would be able to provide yeah. you for the same services. So it all depends on the situation. Again, we come back to the <laughs> the same thing, where uh, it is it is the the whole piece of where you are engaging, who you are engaging with. Uh, where they are at in their journey and Mm. what is it they can offer. So there we are at in in (laughs) terms of I I just let that flow as is. And um, I I just kind of am a big believer that whatever is mine will find me. Mm. Yeah, I think one should abide by that. And I think one of the mistakes which I have like seen people especially international students doing is they run after money rather than really polishing their skills and then you know your point comes in if if you are really providing the value that will be appreciated th- that that money will come your way you know that's that's exactly how it works so Trinam, in one of your videos I saw on YouTube, you know, you were talking about your parents and you were thanking them for instilling in the set of values that enables you to make the right choice. Talk a little bit more about that and also about the life that you spent in Jammu, the time that you spent in Jammu. Tell us more about that. Well, honestly, Gurusis, I it's it's just so hard to put that in a nutshell. <laughs> I, I will just say my parents raised me with a lot of love i was raised as a child not as a gender mm. i was raised with with um care confidence kindness generosity um approaching life with a a, a very humane uh touch those those were the values that were given to me and i practice them to this day and i hope and pray that if it is if this is the one thing that i pass on these are the values that i pass on to my kids uh, of being a good human being mm. of being kind to people irrespective without expectations mm. so that is the the set of values that was given to me my my parents are very well known in the community my father, he um, retired as inspector general of police, mm. um, decorated with as number of, uh, you know, facilitations and medals that you can name right from the president's medal to uh, distinction and mm. whatnot, and multiple times. So he's had an exemplary uh, service record. Uh, my vi- my mother, um, a- at the same time, she's very well known for... Um, her her grace her grace and uh, her the the skills she has and how she likes to share them so everything that i learned on early on in my childhood were is is still imbibed in in somewhere in inside of me in terms of the life i lived in jammu it it was a wonderful time mm. uh, as a kid i went to convent Again, a wonderful time where at that time, 
we never knew any differences. So I had a great set of friends. It was a co-education environment. We had just maybe in a class of, um, I would say around 30, 35 kids. Mm-hmm. We had 10 boys okay. and we were all friends and mm-hmm. we are still friends. Uh, after this many years, <laughs> we we have a Facebook group that we keep in touch through. Uh, they are scattered all over the world. Some are back in India, some are also abroad. So it, it was a very good time, a, a time where we cared for each other. We were there to support each other. We would have a lot of fun, um, f- uh, filled with kindness and love mm. is how I can summarize it. Um, the the few things that I, that really are, you know how you, how you say you can, come away from the place but the place stays mm, within you yeah exactly um if i have to yeah the first thing that comes to mind is you know the the fragrance of rain on dry soil it's it has a, it has a unique fragrance oh yeah that uh, just the, that is a memory the the grandeur of gulmohar trees Mm. those orange bright red uh, flowers still remain my favorite uh the roses jammu is a city when in march you have blooms everywhere and the fragrance and you know you can the chirping of the birds uh, the you know the coils when oh god it's it's beautiful beautiful memories uh from from those times the minute I can like just sit and reflect, those are the memories that crop up right away. The word Chinab kept coming in my mind. Mm-hmm. The river Chinab. <laughs> when I was describing the sounds, the one thing that I did not touch upon is when you can just sit next to Chinab and just listen to it. Just listen to the water flowing. Oh, wow. And if, you, if you've not tried that and... It's, you know, the kadak chai, mm. uh, chai tea with uh, with hot, hot pakore. Oh, yeah. And the rain is falling. The monsoon rain is there. I, we used to do that. We, My parents and I, I would say, okay, it's raining now. Let's, in the monsoon season, let's go for a drive. So, sorry, but <laughs> that memory just flashed <laughs> into you, my you're eyes. You're making me hungry as well now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that food is a big part of my family and my culture and, yeah. you know, my life. So, and thank you for reminding me of all those good times. It's it's very fascinating you said that, Random. You know, I think nobody has described their home country the way you have done that. So I absolutely loved it. Tell me what influenced the decision to move. Tell me about that. Ex- excellent. So I'll tell you what, um, and I've written about it, hmm. actually. Mm. A couple of times there was a blog post that I did and even in my one of the books that I wrote, it was uh, my cousin, actually. Uh, when I was in my high, high school teens, so uh, that is the time he moved to Canada and he would come back and he had these very nice stories about this neat, green, clean place and the one thing that really, really fascinated me were the colors. Colors, you know, crayons. Mm-hmm. So back at that time, when I was growing up in India, you could only have a set of 12 crayons, right? Mm-hmm. For From your general store, that is what you would get. Yeah. And I am fascinated by colors. I'm, uh, art is my uh, my go-to, my, my go-to place, my zen place. Mm-hmm. So he got a pack of colors, crayons, which I don't know had more than 52 shades Mm. and he got it for his daughter. I think something to do with that, those stories and the colors that he brought back. And when I saw those colors, I said, Oh my God, for me, that meant opportunity for me. That meant if this place is so ahead and advanced that we have 12 and they have a set of 52 of different shades. This is where I want to be. Okay. Mm-hmm. That was the first, first trigger. But then again, that was a, like, you know, a, a, ch- a child's um, envisioning or dreaming of a place. Mm-hmm. But then when I grew older, it just so happened that I, when I was in my master's, um, we were studying 
uh, English literature. And at that time, we had a department of, uh, uh, you know, new literatures. And part of that was Canadian Canadian literature. And as I studied um, the fiction, I actually fell in love with the fiction that um, that was coming out of Canada. Specifically, I I used to love reading Margaret Lawrence. She's uh, known as one of the like you know the pioneers. Um, so ultimately, ended up taking Prairie literature for my PhD thesis. Mm-hmm. Um, and the stories of settlement and the sacrifice and the hardship and women and the relationship that was, you know, uh, showcased to land and how people were struggling yet breaking it and yet being successful, Hmm. um, kind of spoke to me. It was, it was, you know, uh, they were not scared of hardship. They were not, mm, they would not just step back just because it was hard to, to be successful here. Mm -hmm. So I guess that was part of it. Then I came here, visited uh, as a scholar and uh, I got selected um, for the Western summer seminar. Um, Again, having experienced how people were here and I had a lot of extended family Mm -hmm. here. So, um, you know, eventually it came down to, okay, maybe there will be a time when I would want to, uh, you know, call this place home as well. Mm-hmm. Um, finally, uh, you know, it it kind of changed after I had worked for around four or five years as a university administrator. And I was like, okay, I think I've had my fill, but um, of what I am doing. I would want to explore newer, newer ground. And more importantly, I felt that my, my children could have a better opportunity, uh, a better environment if they were living in Canada. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely one of the, the key reasons. So, so when you moved, like finally, finally moved, how was your first day? What was going on in your mind then? Yeah, that's another interesting question. I was thinking, oh, God, I am so well qualified. And, you know, my, whether it comes mm. to education, whether it comes to experience. And I had um, attended uh, quite a few programs even before I landed here. So I had attended the Chang School uh, from Toronto Metropolitan University. Earlier, it used to be Ryerson. Um, I had enrolled, uh, you know, in CIIP and whatnot, I was being mentored at that time from the registrar of TMU. Um, all in all, I thought I will walk out of the airport and the next day I'm going to land a job. <laughs> that, <laughs> uh, that said, uh, it was grand because as I told you, I have a lot of extended family here. They were all at the airport. There were flowers. There was like, you know, it, it was as if there was a festivity going on. Mm-hmm. Even when I came, um, I came with my husband, my two sons, my parents were with me. Um, and it just so happened that my cousin had been visiting India at that particular point in time. He also came mm, with us, okay. uh, back with us. So it, we, it was like, you know, uh, eight people in the plane that were flying together back. And then there was a crowd of around 20, 25 uh, who were there to receive us at oh, the airport. Wow. Uh, so it was fun. It was just fun and laughter and love. Uh, you know, hugs, a lot of hugs. Mm -hmm. That's how it was uh, on the day we landed. We didn't have to worry about anything. Uh, We were taken, as I I was telling you, very blessed in every way. So, uh, but then the struggle started after that because I'm somebody who likes taking on my own challenges. So I was like, no, no, I don't want anyone, anyone driving me around. No, I don't want to be given rides. I want to figure out my own path. And some, I, I love, understanding the locale so versus you'd be you'd be interested in this and i have shared it with a lot of uh, you know sessions that i've done i share it a lot when i came i took a bus pass at that time you could get a weekly pass you could also get monthly passes Mm -hmm. so uh, presto is a more recent concept at that time you could take a bus pass i would take the bus pass 
the weekly pass and I would just sit on the bus and just go wherever the bus was taking. Just like that. To the very last stop. Yeah. To the very last stop. Mm -hmm. And when the last stop would come, the bus driver sometimes would ask me, are you not getting off? Mm -hmm. I said, no, I'm coming back with you. And they would laugh at me. (laughs) The whole point was, and I would do that in different directions because I was trying to understand the north, south and east, west, which for the longest time evaded me. Uh, My sense of direction wasn't (laughs) happening the way it needed to happen till I realized that the way streets and roads work here are parallel to each other. Mm. And that's how I figured they, they, uh, there is, they run parallel to each other. And if you're able to figure out the intersections of where is what, you'll be able to figure out the next street. Even my family sometimes would say, have you gone crazy? Why do you spend so much time going? And that was my first month. I would, I, I on the bus went to literally every single nonprofit community center, settlement agency, library, um, that I could find and uh, figure out. So that was that was my first month. I was going on the bus to these different places. Sometimes I would come back so tired, uh, but then the next day I was still ready again to go and explore explore even more places. So that would happen constantly for the first month. That's how I started my life in Canada. So tell me, Tarnam, about some of the mistakes that you did that, that people who are coming new can learn from it. Hmm. Excellent question, Grisis. First of all, I don't believe in mistakes because mm-hmm. I believe these are opportunities where you can learn. If you don't mess up, you will never be able to grow and learn. Mm-hmm. So it's important to have those faux pas, have those moments where you're like, what am I doing? Um, You know, I could have done this so much better or whatnot. So I I look at life differently. So I believe, I I really don't don't know if I can call any of those mistakes. Uh, But what I could have done differently Mm -hmm. was maybe not waited for a year to to buy my first home. Um, (laughs) Not that I didn't want to. Um, I wanted to, but um, uh, finding it even at that time was was hard. Uh, It's interesting. I actually ended up living on the same street that I I first rented the house. Um, Like I still live on the same street that I I started Mm -hmm. in the past twelve years. Um, The only thing that has changed is the the house number and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Um. So. uh, yeah that is the that is the one thing i could have done differently what else um i think one other thing that i could have done certainly this is something that i i should have thought about right away was taking care of my health that is one thing i ignored in all of this and you know there are just so many times that my sons remind me and my husband reminds me that you need to pay more attention to yourself um but I ignored it because um, I was like trying to survive. Survivor was the uh, the criteria, being on top of, you know, wanting to be on top of everything, making sh- wanting to make sure that everybody was okay. Mm. Uh, I was living on alert all the time. Uh, so that I think was not the right approach uh to to living my life initially or it's not the approach that one should take at any point in time for that matter mm-hmm. one has to uh be more forgiving uh more more calm um but it's easier said than done um, <laughs> being the kind of person i am and how invested i am in my family i just can't help myself but make sure that I'm always there for them. And that's the approach. I'm I'm very honest towards my relationships, whether mm-hmm. it's a friend, whether it's my my coworkers, my workplace, my my family. 
I do not believe in formalities. I do not believe in uh, putting up facades and doing things for the sake of doing them. I do them with my 100%. Hmm. Genuine... um, genuine desire to be there and that means being physically emotionally and mentally present Mm. so that takes a toll on you I remember uh, one of my friends saying um, you cannot pour from an empty cup Mm. so if if you continue doing this it's going to cause a burnout and I have experienced that. I have experienced that not just one time, a couple of times up until now. It does take a toll on on my mental health, my physical health. Um, I try. I try my best to find moments uh, which allow me to rejuvenate, recover, rest. Um, but then again, as I said, that is another one thing that I would have done differently. It's an established fact. Uh, There are statistics uh, about it that immigrants, when they land here, they are healthier. Mm. And as time goes by, uh, health concerns start showing up due to multiple reasons. I'm sure it's not uh, it's not easy to uproot your life and family and come and start afresh. That takes a toll on you. Mm. But then there are also other pressures uh, of being able to, so you know how, um, how you're judged. You're judged for mm-hmm. how successful you are. The the life that you left behind is always yeah. compared to what you have over here. Mm-hmm. Um, and the life that you had, you have spent years building that up. You not only have spent your time, but you have your whole family's support and background uh, to get you to the place that you are at back home. Mm. Now, when you land here as a newcomer, you're building the whole uh, grassroots level up. Mm. So you're creating new relationships. You are creating new networks. You are creating new career opportunities. You are unlearning the things that are a part, that that is like second nature to you. And then you are learning the ways, the new ways of of the place that you have, you're calling home and reestablishing everything from scratch. So that does take a toll. And that's mm. the reason why health becomes a concern. Mm. I'll actually highlight a few things you said. First was you would have bought your house sooner. Okay. Then you said taking care of your health. And I think I can relate to that a little bit because I think I lost around 15 kgs when I went back after the first time I went back and my mother was like what has happened to you <laughs> you know our mothers get very concerned and possessive about that and the other thing you said about is you know doing not to doing things for other people I think that's something which is instilled in us living in India being in that collectivist society so to say that we we choose some some things we choose to do certain things keeping in mind the social ramifications of things or how we say you know so I think that took I think still I think I've come a long way but still I think now I don't care too much about what other people might or might not say I just do things for myself and including this podcast this whole podcast production is something people have not appreciated when I started but something I feel like I'm showing up I'm doing it because I wanted to do it and I think I'm going to continue doing it as well Absolutely, Gurusis, and don't ever stop. Please don't ever stop. The one thing, one principle I live by is I do things because I believe in them, not because uh, that is something another person wants me to do or I'm doing it for the sake of others. Thankfully for me, my parents never had those expectations. Mm. So I, I never grew up with, so they were like, okay, you want to study? Study whatever you want. You want a profession, choose the profession that you, uh, the only thing I was told by my mother is like, please don't go become a teacher or a doctor. Those mm-hmm. are the <laughs> Other than oh, that, wow. you do whatever you want, right? <laughs> yeah. So I think that came from the fact that I had a, I had a cousin who's a doctor in the family mm-hmm. and she would spend, you know, you, as a doctor, you, you, you work around the clock. Sometimes you're spending nights, um, the children 
at home can get ignored or you might not be there for the family when you you know you you have to be and so things like that so one she kind of did not want that for me and uh, the teacher i'm not sure i don't recall exactly what was the story behind i think mm-hmm. it, it had something to do with uh, teachers have to go despite the fact that they are in such a noble profession they are pushed around by administrators so mm-hmm. there was something around that and that those were the two things she didn't want me to do mm-hmm. well i never became a doctor uh, as far as the teaching goes i i did prof- like become a prof for a bit i have done uh, you know on call uh, instruction and faculty uh, for university back home as well as here but mm-hmm. I didn't do teaching full time as a profession. Mm-hmm. So those those expectations were never uh, laid out for me and I didn't have to follow. My husband's been equally supportive and uh you know he's given me the space. He's never ever interfered with the work I did. He's like and I don't interfere with him either. We we try to give each other the space to be able to do what we need to do, grow as professionals, grow uh, our friend circles, grow our um, life as we need to. So that has been very, very uh, good, I would say, in terms mm-hmm. of our understanding and the space that we need. Um, the expectations that I had of myself, sometimes I feel I was hard on myself. The reason I say this is because I, when I landed here, uh, my parents did not want me to come here. They were like, mm-hmm. you are, you know, at this uh, point in time where you're ready to, uh, to be so comfortable. Why are you uprooting and uh, trying to reestablish and restart your career and life over here? So they were like, oh, we don't want to see you struggle. We don't want you to uh, be in this, you know, constant uh, survival mode. And we'll give you one year. And that's what I said. The one year factor came in from that. So we'll give you one year, try it out. And if you feel that, if we feel that the standard of living is not the same as you used to have Mm. back home, then let's just wrap up and go back. Mm. So that was uh, the reason uh, for me to give myself that one year before I bought the house and give myself one year before um, I, I, where I was like doing crazy stuff to make sure that they were comfortable and they never questioned uh, the decision that I had made for my family to to be here. Because my parents had retired by then and they were ready to live their comfortable life. Had they not agreed to move with me, I would not have come. So that was the kind of bargain that I had with them. If you come with me and you try it out there, if you're able to, if you see that I'm successful, then we can continue over there. If not, then we can always move back. So the the condition that I had placed for myself wasn't for others, was was to show them that I have been successful one time in, Mm -hmm. in the country that I started my my life and career from but i can be successful in a new home as well so that's how it all happened awesome to know more part to you i love that <laughs> <laughs> thank you one of the things uh, you know Trenum, I also talk about in my trailer is you know breaking some stereotypical molds the immigrants are asked to fit in and as I'm having these conversations with with people from all around the world and and also being you know grown up in a patriarchal household I'm aware that women are also asked to fit in some stereotypical molds their life is mm-hmm. planned some way like it is already planned by like a third person sometimes and yes things are changing but there is still a long way to go and I think you would be the right person to ask this ask your thoughts about this because I'm I know that you have been breaking those stereotypical molds as well talk a little bit more about that so Grisis if you recall I started when I was telling you how I was raised yeah Hmm. that is where it all started I think I was never raised with that mindset so that um, that mold or that that norm never existed in my mind. I was not told I'm a girl and I have to uh, be a good girl, mm-hmm. so to say. Um, 
and I had to do behave a certain way. I had to dress a certain way. I had to talk a certain way. I was the brat. I mm. grew up like a child, as I told you. I was never told you can do this or that uh, because you're a girl or because you're not a girl. Um, I was always encouraged uh, to be myself, voice my opinions, um, treated just like another person in the household. Mm -hmm. So I think that had a lot of lot to do with how I see the, how, how I see things. Mm. Uh, sometimes my sons uh, remind me uh, that I am not not the you know what you would ordinarily see. I am somebody who who has had um, uh, you know opportunities and a life that um, that is not that is not common to everybody mm. else. So yeah. thankfully for me, I as I said, I have had a very blessed life. Um, I I grew up with a lot of confidence instilled in in my assets, in my abilities, in my skills. And I remember my parents, they were, the one thing they they would constantly encourage me to do is get educated. They never told me to learn A, B, or C. They said, you know, read, read and be knowledgeable. Be, uh, be somebody who is always acquiring skills. It wasn't, uh, you have to learn cooking because you have to get married. Hmm. It was yeah. never... Uh, you have to learn uh, typing or learn how to use a computer because you have to become a secretary. No, yeah. I, I never grew up like that. So I was told to be knowledgeable and encouraged to learn everything that I wanted. And that kind of played a huge part uh, in, in breaking down those norms. And that's how I approached life. In terms of how I have broken some examples for you. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I happened to be um, studying at that time. I had completed my master's, was enrolled in my uh, pre-PhD, and the opportunity to work came up, right, at the university. There were two positions that were available at the University of Jammu. One was of being a professor for the same department that I was I had graduated from, mm. the Department of English. Yeah. Uh, so all you needed was a master's to be able to apply Okay. And then the other opportunity was to become an administrator at the university. Uh, and again, all you needed was a master's to apply. Uh, for the administrator's role, you had to also sit in an exam similar to that you would do for civil services or KS or, you know, one of those qualifying exams. Mm -hmm. uh, when the time came, I opted for the administrator's role. And I was asked this question in my interview, instead of going for that, uh, uh, you know, the professor's role. Yeah. I was asked in the interview, why did you opt for this position? Because this is very demanding. The hours are long. The, uh, you, the expectations, for that matter, if I can put it uh, mm -hmm. nicely, there had been no woman administrator in that university. I was mm. the first one. Uh, to join administration. So when in the interview I was asked, I, my family, just like you were mentioning, everybody's in, uh, in medicine and, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> business. For my family, most people have been administrators. So uh, civil services, uh, police, um, um, human services, and so on and so forth. So it, it, it came to me naturally, administration and learning how things are done from my father himself. That's how it, um, I, that's what I told them. I said, for me, administration comes to me naturally. I have learned it. I have absorbed it. And I believe that I can uh, be uh, a contributing factor mm. uh, to the organization. So I do not believe in doing a nine to like, you know, nine to five and leaving my workplace. I think I am capable of way more. Uh, they reminded me that as a woman, I, mm -hmm. um, I would have to do long hours. I said, it does not matter. It's about the quality of the work. And when, when the, when those long hours are needed, I'm committed to giving them. So, um, I was also told that if I was selected for that role, 
based on my performance, they mm-hmm. would determine whether any other women would ever join administration again. Wow. Well, Gursis, I have left my mark over there. After working, I, again, uh, after working there, I think after three years of my tenure there, now they have five or more administrators who are women and join that, that university in that designation. And I can uh, very proudly say in my tenure, I, I left a mark there. Uh, I'm still remembered in good words, if I can say so myself. <laughs> I still have great relationships with a with a lot of uh, professors, with uh, colleagues, co-administrators that work with me. And I have left a legacy for sure. So that was breaking norms. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, kudos to you. And I think you have break, broken those norms back in India. And I think you're doing the same here as well. I do, do see you doing this, this tremendous work. And people are so inspired by you just, just to share uh, work that you have done so far. And and I'm sure the people listening to this, I will recommend them to really reach out to Tranum if you have any questions or any concerns or anything that that they think they would like to work more on. I will put the links in the show notes as well. And Tranum, also please tell us about the poem that you wrote, which was called Empty, you know, that which you were catering to women and asking them not to let their emotional bank get empty. Talk about that. So as I was telling you earlier, I, I actually was speaking to you about it earlier. Um, when there came a time when I was feeling burnt out mm-hmm. and my friend pointed out that, um, you know, it's great to to give it your 100%, but then you have to be mindful of how you are placed, where you are at at in that point in time and while it's amazing to be able to give one should not be shy of taking uh, time for oneself as well so that's exactly what i it's a it's a dedication to women mothers sisters daughters and for that matter not just women to men as well they work extremely hard to to support the families and they they are under tremendous pressure. I recognize that. It's mm-hmm. not just the women who are under pressure. Women are, of course, under pressure from various uh, from various aspects uh, in terms of being the nurturer, being the, the person uh, who's providing the emotional stability at home, uh, being there for, you know, all kinds of relations, but at the same time, there is a burden that men carry too of, mm. of being the provider and being judged for not, uh, not fitting into the norms that society has set exactly. uh, for a man. You have to behave in a certain way. You have to show up in a certain way. You cannot be crying. You cannot have mental breakdowns. You cannot be nervous. You have to be confident at all times. No, that's not the mm. fact. We are human beings. We have to approach life, whether you're a man or a woman or any gender for that matter. You have to approach life um, in a way which allows you to be yourself. Mm. You have to approach yourself with kindness first. Um, And that's exactly the message that I have given through that poem, that if your own, if you become empty, if you become devoid, completely drained of what you have whether it's the love if whether it's the care whether it's your time whether it's your energy then how are you going to give to others so take the time to refill your own cup whether it's through engaging in activities that help uh, nourish your emotions or or uh, peace of mind, whether you are engaging in, whether it's prayer for you, whether it's meditation mm-hmm. for you, whether it's exercise for you, it's whether it's a, as simple as, you know, just stepping out in the nature and taking a walk, mm-hmm. whether it's cooking a meal that reminds you of, of home, like, uh, you know, a, whether it, simple things, the very, very simple things, dressing up, uh mm. going to uh, uh going to watch a movie or you know just having a dress down day and relaxing and not putting any makeup on for mm. that matter anything that helps you with calming your nerves 
taking the time to recover and recoup is is very very important and that's the message that my um that my poem is all about where i'm talking that if you do not take care of the cup that you are sharing with others from then it's going to be empty and you won't be able to give anything because you will not have it within you to give anymore 100% i i i i totally agree to that that i know in my intro i did talk about you know you being a co-author and you also talked about it in the beginning about about being a co-author of the book 21 resilient women tell us about the inception of this idea you know that women coming together writing this book and also about the chapter that you wrote which was the finding the opportunity and adversity tell us about that sure so again um if you recall i was talking about the visioning events mm-hmm. uh, that daisy has this is my third book so i have co-authored two other books focused on um, women life and career and this particular one was another uh, incident that i shared of how um i was able to take a situation which was adverse and which which was uh, bringing me down and converted that into an opportunity to kind of bounce back to where i needed to be mm-hmm. so that in a nutshell is the gist um i have spoken about making sure that you you walk on the path that your heart desires but always making sure that you are taking your head with you you're not making mm-hmm. emotionally charged decisions mm-hmm. uh in terms of the book how it came into being daisy uh had this idea at one of the visioning events that was in 2020 that uh, she would be inviting a few few women uh to contribute to a book that she uh had decided to to co-create mm-hmm. and um and i uh, of course wanted to be a part of it and share the story that i wanted to tell uh we did that in 2021 and then uh, the book came out it got published it was it's a best seller self help uh, books mm-hmm. on amazon uh, more recently uh, it is on now also available on audible okay so um yeah it, it, it's an amazing piece you will find women from different walks of life uh came together uh you have women from all across across uh south asia mm. um uh, afro um afro caribbean uh diaspora you have people from uh the west us you have people from canada and they they all came together to write their own stories and show how not to lose hope how mm-hmm. if if you surround yourself with the right set of people uh you will be lifted up you will be nurtured and taken care of so it was an amazing experience uh quite a few of these women uh are very well known in their fields um mm-hmm. i will not take one name because then that way I'm, I'm, it's a disservice so i would encourage people to look up the book there's a there's a whole piece all the co-authors are listed on amazon as well as on audible um the stories are phenomenal they they are inspirational they'll give you hope they will give you uh steps how to deal with difficult situations in life and difficult situations can come as health challenges as family challenges as as career challenges and what not so there are many many pieces of advice and uh, tips and you know navigation that you can learn from that book so to all my listeners check out the inspiring stories of women from around the world the link can be found in the show notes Okay Tanu so now let's just pivot towards the recruitment consultant job which is one of the many jobs that you do where you talk to students particularly immigrants and guide them with their job search journey so tell us about the most commonly asked questions if you remember and what is your answer to that um that's a great question uh, gurasi um i i find that um most people that are new to the country 
they are kind of struggling to get their first break Mm -hmm. uh, into either the career path that they have been or a career path that they're aspiring to be in. So it, it, it varies if if they are um, a skilled immigrant and they have landed here, the questions will be different because if mm-hmm. you are from a regulated profession and you wanted to work as a doctor or as an engineer yeah. where you have to have the right set of qualifications and then uh, qualifying exams from Canada, then the conversation is different. Yeah. And then the steps are based on what they need to do to you know, get there, Mm -hmm. how much time it takes, whatnot. But if it is uh, international students who are enrolled in a certain program, then the conversations are around, okay, what can I do to build up my resume uh, or get the opportunities uh, with employers in Canada uh, while I'm, you know, still completing my education? So it just depends on uh, where they are at in in their journey and what is their given situation at that point in time. Uh, the one thing I, I do tell them that if I can be successful in all that I have done, I'm mm-hmm. sure each and every person uh, that is listening to this podcast can do it better. Because when I came, uh, it was still 2011 and now we are in 2022, yeah. which means the technology, uh, the openness, and with COVID, uh, technology has really fast-tracked. People have become way more uh, open to whether it's Facebook requests or LinkedIn requests or Instagram or TikTok or interviews um, uh, happening virtually. All of those things fast-track 2020 onwards. Mm -hmm. So the opportunities that were not available virtually are now available to you for grabs. The one thing that I tell everyone to do, however, is be genuine, be Mm -hmm. patient, and don't make your job, job search a liability for the other person. So approaching the conversation with care, Mm -hmm. with professionalism, with the right etiquette. It's very important. You are landing here in Canada, whether it's as an international student or an immigrant, should not be somebody else's burden. It You have to take ownership of your career path and you have to invest in building your network, your connections. You have to take ownership of the research and the time and effort you need to put in uh, to to get a better understanding of what is the culture, what is the workplace um, uh, culture in Canada, what are the expectations of the employers in Canada, how can you uh, approach and reach the right kind of uh, people or, or decision makers so that you are successful in finding the opportunities. So again, the onus It is very important that the onus on the job search, the onus of finding the right career rests with you. That's the one piece of uh, advice or suggestion that I give irrespective of uh, who the person is that is talking to me. And that goes for everyone, even if they are not an immigrant, whether you are a student, whether you are a young professional, whether you are somebody who is an executive leader. The ownership of your career trajectory is yours to take. But, but you know, sometimes it happens that, you know, certain name, if somebody is coming with a certain experience from a different country, you know, you being from a different country, there are certain names on your resume, certain companies you have worked with, which are not recognized here. Or even some achievements are very like mm-hmm. cultural specific, you know. So so tell me that how should one gauge that situation or how were you able to convey that value here in a foreign land? Of course, and uh, that is expected. That uh, I, I'm not surprised uh, when people are not aware of 
what University of Jammu yeah. is. It's just sure. another university to them. They don't know that. Uh, they don't know the ranking. They don't know that it's uh, A plus accredited or whatnot. So the one thing that as a uh, employment counselor or a career strategist that I suggest is don't bring up those names because those mm-hmm. names are not familiar unless it's a fa- uh, Fortune 500 company yeah. um, where the person will be able to t- don't bring it up because it's not important. The important aspect for any employer in Canada is the attitude that you bring to the work. The the important aspect is the skills, the Mm. value proposition, the strengths, the qualification that you have. It It is not important which company you gained it at. It is not important where you gained it at. Mm. They already know that. They have seen your resume. They can see that you are a recent either immigrant or student and they're willing to take their chance when they give you that interview call as long as you have done your resume nicely. Mm. So it is up to you to have prepared an elevator pitch, which Mm. is like a 30 second commercial of yourself (laughs) where you are breaking it down for the employer. Yeah, exactly. So you're telling them who you are. You're telling them what is your education uh credentials whatever have you you're telling them what is the experience you are bringing Mm -hmm. and what is it that you're looking for and never touching upon where you are coming from like it can be from anywhere in the world you don't have to name a country you don't have to name the companies that you worked for Mm -hmm. focus on the sector focus on the field focus on the qualification focus on your strengths and what can you do for the employer rather than uh, X, Y, and Z? This is this is like, you know, you are on stage. You mm-hmm. are the product. You don't have yeah. to give, you don't have, need to shine the light on another organization where you work. That's not important because mm-hmm. you're not going to work for that organization anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's very important that you focus and, yeah, focus on yourself. You know, uh, I think I mentioned it before on the podcast, you know, when I came, I worked for as a like a media agency for Adani. And I would come and talk about the name Adani, Adani all the time. And that would give me like no reactions. But then I started saying, oh, it's an Indian multinational conglomerate. Oh, okay. So then like follow up questions came in. And then I was able to convey the value of the job I was doing. So learning the local vocabulary, learning the uh, the verbiage that is yeah. used in that particular sector. And that is where I, when I was referring to ownership, mm-hmm. research is a big part of the ownership. Listen and observe the kind of words and terminology that the sector that you want to work for is using. Mm-hmm. What is it that they want to hear from you? Don't mm-hmm. go telling them your story and at length explaining uh, you know, things that they would not connect with. Mm-hmm. You have to find that common ground. Yeah. And the best way to do it is by using the, the language that they would understand. You'll have to fine tune your own language. Yeah, finding the Canadian equivalent of the things that you have done in your own country. Yeah. Exactly. So one thing that, and this was a fun thing that we used to do, the part of the icebreakers when I used mm-hmm. to work in the employment services sector, I would ask them to watch uh, funny videos mm-hmm. of um, um, of these YouTubers. Mm-hmm. That uh, even like at that time, the YouTubers that were popular were Lily Singh mm. and um, uh, Justreen, Justreen, and then even for that mm-hmm. matter, Russell Peters, yeah. and there were a few others. I would say go watch these. You will understand the local language that is spoken over here Mm. i would always encourage people to listen to you know the radio instead Mm. of listening to the radio from back home and looking for news from back home focus and that's a practice that i have Mm. anytime i'm in the car i will have either 99.1 fm or uh, 97.5 fm one of those radio stations where you can listen to what's happening over here Mm. you can listen so the more you listen, the better you become at speaking the language. Mm-hmm. That's that's the bottom line. You will know the words that are being used. You will understand the phrases, how they are 
they are structured because phrases as well are are structured differently over here and mm-hmm. you will understand what do you need to say to get your message across mm-hmm. i have had multiple situations where uh where you know i was not able to do it and i was very upset and i'll i can share two of those situations with you mm-hmm. one was a time um so this was more appearance wise so mm-hmm. uh, this would be our like maybe third month in canada i would say or or less and we had already rented a house so the house had a basement and in the basement mm-hmm. somebody else was living right okay one day i noticed smoke coming out of from under the door of the basement mm. and that didn't seem right and then i ran upstairs and i saw smoke coming out of the vents from uh, in the upper upper floor as well mm-hmm. so i ran down and i called the the owner and i'm mm-hmm. like i see smoke coming out i think there is a fire uh, in the basement and he's like oh my god call 911 mm-hmm. and i called 911 and and he said i will call the person who lives in the basement okay. so i called 911 right away uh, uh, and they they instructed me to kind of just walk out of the house and mm-hmm. wait in the front mm-hmm. front yard so i took my family um we were dressed in our traditional wear and we just uh, kind of took a chair for my mom she was on that chair under the tree and we were all standing there together and mm-hmm. this fire truck pulls up and the cars pull up and the sirens are going and their lights and blinging mm-hmm. and the whole neighborhood is looking at us mm-hmm. and they and i'm like okay they are thinking this this fog family <laughs> has just arrived and they've already set the house on fire but whereas it is no fault of ours and right at the moment the the owner rushes and then the person who actually lived uh, in the basement he was the last to arrive okay mm-hmm. so it had so happened that he had been doing I, i i don't know he was doing some kind of frying and he accidentally forgot to turn the gas off he had left it on a sim like the slow sim to the point where everything in the basement had turned black and it would have had i not called 911 at the time i called there mm-hmm. would have been a huge fire oh no and the house would have burned down so anyways the saved in the moment and you know the fire marshal after everything all the commotion died down he mm-hmm. walks up to me and i'm standing there in my uh, salwar kameez and he <laughs> comes to me and says does anyone here know english for a second i you know was like oh, excuse me that was the reaction excuse me <laughs> i i did not say anything other i said i'm the one who called mm. and then he looks at me <laughs> and both of us just looking at each other we understood what had just happened Mm. he had made a huge assumption that just mm. because i was the whole family is dressed in south asian attire he, uh, he thought we did not know any english or we would not understand and that one sentence put everything in context mm. so <laughs> uh you can be judged for for a lot of reasons i was the one who had saved the day by calling and you know the whole neighborhood <laughs> must have also thought whatever they were thinking so that was one without uh, without any filters that happened to to us and the other situation was a really harsh one actually mm-hmm. there was a point in time where when me when we moved into our own house and we got tenants and this mm-hmm. tenant would uh, was for the basement and uh, this time the tables were turned and the tenant was giving me a very hard time they were um uh, to the point without going into any details where i was uh i was feeling that my children and the the safety of our household was at risk mm. um i called the cops nobody showed up uh but when the tenants called the cops uh, the cops came and no. i was baffled i was like what's going on and like i don't understand ha- 
I did see that when the cops were there and when they interacted with me and when they interacted with the, the tenant, they could understand what was going on and they they told the tenant off. Hmm. But having said that, um, I was not using the right phrases. I was, despite having called the cops, uh, the the I did not have the the kind of language which mm-hmm. would convey um, which which cops are used to or which the system is used to, and mm-hmm. uh, that is why I was not being served the way I needed to be served, mm-hmm. and I was uh, kind of at the receiving end there. Um, it was hard and lesson learned. Um, that it is important to understand uh, when you are approaching a service provider the the kind of language you need to use with them. Mm. So that's that's another example of where um, you really, really must take the time to learn the kind of vocabulary that is required to be successful and survive in Canada. Thank you for sharing these stories, uh, Tarano. I, I think this is something clearly it, it tells it tells the immigrants to learn the local lingo because that's the best way to really express the things that you want to express. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Now we are in the final segment of the podcast. I call it Beneath the Accent because we are knowing each other beneath our accents. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You can answer them in one word or a sentence or however you feel like. The idea is just to know more about Tarano. So the first question is, what's one habit you adopted that has changed your life? Mindfulness. Is there something that you recently buy that you now regret? Recently, I've actually not bought anything. I'm trying to steer away from buying. Uh, and this is one habit I have incorporated that I'm not going to buy unnecessarily things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know how we invest in we. Every time you want to go out, you are, you don't you never have enough clothes. That <laughs> <laughs> like despite the yeah. the wardrobe being full, it's always so. That is one thing that I've incorporated: not buying clothes. Uh, I I really don't know. I I didn't recently buy anything that I did not need. I I've really been mm. mindful about my buying habits. Okay. Name three things from your bucket list. Bucket list for sure. Um so for my um my spiritual and my uh, religious uh, point of view, the one thing mm. I definitely have on my bucket list is being able to perform Hajj and Umrah. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's really, really important to me. Uh, in terms of my career bucket list, mm-hmm. the one thing that I have on my uh, list is to to establish um, establish an organization um, that caters at at a triangular level where where you are getting uh, services that cater to your basic needs, but also to your, um, you know, the the hierarchy of principles kind of yeah. approach where you're ca- catering to the basic need, but also mm-hmm. making sure that once that is established, especially for immigrants, yeah. uh, once that's established, you are able to nurture and grow. And then pushing you forward for uh, the leadership that that you aspire to be in. So a, a kind of tiered three-level approach, um, that is on my career bucket list. And mm-hmm. then finally, in terms of my, my fun, because now, as I said, I'm being more mindful of nurturing myself. I definitely deserve a vacation mm-hmm. and... Um, that I'm I'm thinking uh, on uh, in terms of, but I've not decided when and where. <laughs> okay. So who is Tarannum's go-to person? Okay. That's, uh, again, it's, it's situation dependent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my all-time go-to people are my sons. Okay. I go to them for, for love. I go to them for advice. I go to them for learning. I go to them with complaints. I go to them when I'm angry. Uh, 
I go to them when I need help uh, mm. with something, whether it's, uh, you know, the limitations with technology or uh, putting a bulb, <laughs> replacing mm. uh, a tap, whatnot. So those are my go-to, go-to people all the time. Is there any movie that you like to watch over and over again? Ah, beautiful question. Um, for the longest time, and there are many that mm-hmm. I, that I love watching on repeat, uh, but I'm going to name one uh, which I have also told a lot of immigrants to watch, The King's Speech. It's a must. It's a must for anyone. Uh, the King's Speech, I, I have shared that with my students. I've shared that with, with immigrants. It is, it is inspiring. It tells you to never give up. It tells you that there is always um, there is always room to grow and mm-hmm. learn things that you've not done in the past, and that are ho- th- th- you can break barriers that are holding you back. So something mm-hmm. that I I believe in very strongly. And I, um, I would, uh, you know, recommend that that movie to everyone. Okay, I haven't watched. I think I think I'll definitely watch that. If you, Tranum, had to eat just one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? I love food. There's just so many <laughs> foods that that are coming to mind. Uh, okay, rice with uh, eggplant cooked in tomatoes, hmm. the Nepali way. That's okay. what I I can have like as many number of times and I never get bored of it. If you were to ask my non-vegetarian self, then it would be like, I have two sides to my, I'm vegetarian on certain days and non-vegetarian on others. So Mm -hmm. uh, my go-to food is an egg because Mm -hmm. I feel that is the most satisfying when you are, when you eat an, uh, at least for me, it's a satisfying mm-hmm. meal. I can use it as in my breakfast. I can use it in my lunch or dinner. I very in very different ways. But if if you were asking my my favorite food, uh, that, and that's really helped me uh, stay healthy uh, in terms of, and specifically because I struggled with weight loss. So protein and salad, uh, mm-hmm. where I do chicken and salad. And salad could be just lettuce, tomatoes, onions, um, mm-hmm. cucumbers, and uh, just any type of chicken, even if it's curry chicken, just uh, without any carbs. So those mm-hmm. would be the foods that are my go-to foods. So describe Canada in one word or a sentence. Heart. It's all heart. So finally, if you could leave me with one piece of advice that I know, what would it be? Always smile. Keep that smile going, Gurzis, because smile can do wonders. And that's that's another thing that uh, I feel has helped me and I have gotten uh, compliments for and then I have uh, been likable for and then I have been able to build rapport because of there are times I smile so much that my cheeks hurt. And this is, I'm, I'm being very honest. This is something that I've said in my workshops that at, at one point in time, it starts hurting here, but I continue <laughs> to smile. Um, gift smiles as well. Like, you know, even when you are going through a hard day, even when the other person that you don't know anything about is going through a hard day, one smile can set the tone for a conversation or uh, change the mood, change the whole dynamics of how one is feeling. Mm. So I would I would just say keep smiling and continue to gift smiles. Perfect. Thank you, Tranum. On that note, thank you so much for being on the podcast and adding value to my listeners. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Pleasure is all mine. Hey, listener. Thank you for making it to the end. I highly, highly appreciate you listening to the podcast. Subscribe to the podcast if you haven't as yet. And please share with your friends or anybody you think would like it. And like I always say, we encourage you to follow your heart. But also us on Instagram, the handle is my thick accent. You can also leave us a review or write to us at hello at mythickaccent.com. So stay tuned and let's continue knowing each other beneath the accent.